Hi everybody. <clears throat> Haven't done a video in a couple days, so uh, I'm in the middle of actually doing some video on a new project that I've been working on. It's a uh, Ico ST70 vacuum tube stereo integrated amplifier. And I'm doing a full restore on it. <clears throat> and uh, I'll be posting the first of a series of videos on that here soon, but it's going to take a little while. Uh, that's been an involved project and funding is pretty thin right now and ordering the parts is going to be expensive so uh, I may not get to move as quickly on that project as I had hoped to. So anyhow in the meantime I thought I'd take some time here today to answer some viewer questions because they're kind of stacking up and I had a little bit of free time this afternoon so I thought I would take a little time to share with you all and uh, go over some of these things. The first kind of group of questions I've been getting is regarding transistors. Um, I've gotten an awful lot of varying questions about transistors and semiconductors and one of the, one of the ones I got was first of all how how do you replace some of these older transistors with modern replacements okay and that's a pretty complicated question um, the short answer is you can do it and you do not have to use the exact transistor that you had before however uh, there's a lot of factors that almost are too much for me to talk about in this little short video here on this thing on the answer of this question. But in a nutshell, there's a few things you need to realize. First and foremost, if you're just talking about a general signal transistor, so in other words, we're not replacing a transistor in a tuner, it's not an oscillator, it's not high frequency or RF, but something used for audio. Um, first of all, you want to make sure that it is a, a good quality transistor. Some of the really cheap ones you get online from China may or may not be um, original even though they have the right part number. Uh, here's an example. So there's this is a very popular transistor and I don't know if we can even see if I can get some light on it you can see probably not. Um, it's basically a 2N2222 there you go can you see it? So this is a very common NPN small signal transistor it can get up into some of the RF frequencies, but it's a very good general purpose NPN transistor. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you want to make sure that the transistor you get is good quality and that it's a low noise transistor. When you put these, you know, talking about audio, okay, like an amplifier or something like that, you want to make sure these transistors are quiet. In other words, some of these transistors tend to have a, a slight leakage where they'll leak and basically when they're in circuit they will cause a background hissing sound like a just like air leaking out of a tire. Um, some of them do it very little but when you crank the volume up you can hear it and it's because of the low quality transistor. So that's the first thing I'd recommend is get a reputable transistor from a reputable company. In other words, if you're going to get you know, a transistor that's made by Motorola or made by ST Micro or some company, some big name company, make sure it really is from that company and that it's not a restamped one from China that's a lower end. You know, for, for turning it on and off an LED or something, that's just fine. And when you're talking about being in the audio path of something, you want to be a little more picky about that. Now, here's where the bigger problem is you can go online and you can look up a data sheet very easily for a transistor so you go into your your search engine and for instance if you had this transistor this 2N2222 you could just very simply on the search bar type in 2N2222 data sheet and I guarantee you you get a whole bunch of hits look for the ones that have the word in parentheses PDF that means that's going to be a direct link to a PDF file that will open when you click on it that will typically open up to the data sheet for this. So you can first of all download and print that out. That way you get the specs. 
You know, how many volts does the transistor handle? What is the wattage dissipation it can handle? What are the frequencies? What is the gain? All those different things. Then when you're going to look at your replacements, um, you at least know what it is you need, what specs you need to fit the bill. Now, the more confusing thing, and I'm going to do this here, is this little chart that I drew out. I just took some time and sketched this down. And this is still not the most, you know, not, this is not the end-all, be-all final word. Um, this is just an idea. So, for instance, if you look at a transistor labeled 2N something like this one, 2N2222. If you take it and you flip it with the pins pointing at you, so you're looking into the pins like that. That's the view I'm showing you. So you see here, it's kind of shaped like the letter D, as in dog. We hold it. That's the orientation. Then this pin is going to be the emitter. The center pin will be the base. The right pin will be the collector. Okay. EBC. Now, if you have another transistor, like a B, something that starts with 2SA, or 2SB, or 2SC, or 2SD, these little designators can tell you a little bit about the transistor, but they don't always follow a perfect format. They can vary. But for instance, 2SA, anything that's 2SA is going to be a PNP polarity transistor and anything 2SC is an NPN and again 2SBs are PNP 2SDs are NPN okay however the pinouts can be different and even among these it's not always that so for instance on the 2SAs and 2SCs on a lot of them it goes collector emitter base if you look at it However, if you look at the 2SBs, 2SDs, a lot of them will be emitter collector base. They're out of order. And if you look at the BC series, anything that starts with BC and some numbers, almost all of them are collector base emitter. Except for anything that's BC635 to BC640, that series is collector emitter base kind of like the 2SA, 2SCs. So what I'm trying to say is that just because a transistor has the same ratings and the same values, the package may, it may be the same case even, but the pinout might be different. So you can't just randomly grab one of these and solder it in place of your old transistor because this might be the case. And in some instances, you can't twist these pins around. Some of them the pins are backwards. The center pin, as long as the center pin is always the same, you can flip the transistor 180 degrees and still have the correct pin out. But if the center pin is swapped with an outer pin, you can't do that, and that's not a very going to be a very good replacement transistor because you're going to have to twist the pins around funny, and that can cause shorts and all kind of problems. You don't want to do that. So be very aware of that. That's the first thing. Second thing is when replacing a transistor you really it, it's not not bad to go with one it's kinda like a capacitor if you go with one that has higher voltage ratings and higher wattage dissipation ratings that's actually a good thing just so long as the frequency response the gain things like that are the same so you can get a little overrated transistor pop it in there and it will work, and actually it may work even better because it may not get as hot and it may be able to, it'll last longer because you're putting less stress on it than on the original one that was running closer to its ratings. So that's another thing. So I hope those couple things at, answered your question. You can replace these with modern equivalent. And a lot of times people have already done the homework for you. So you can go onto some of the forums like Audio Karma and so forth and you can look uh, look for threads dealing with replacing transistors on a specific model and some people have already done it and crossed them over to numbers and have, that they've tested and that worked that's the easiest way to do it All right. so uh, that's the answer to that question alright 
next question. I got a little picture of a schematic here, just so you're not staring at the boring table. But it's in the same line of the transistor question. Okay, so let's say you go ahead and you cross over some transistors. Okay, so you're looking up here on your schematic, and you find that you have a bad driver transistor somewhere in here or preamp, and you find a suitable replacement and you put it in there and you're pretty sure that's what's wrong but now before you power it up you want to kind of make sure there's not something else wrong there and so how can you do this and not damage your new components maybe you had to order these and they took you a week to get in and they cost you seven or eight dollars of shipping and however many dollars to buy it how do you know you're not going to turn it on and let the smoke out immediately because we all know all these transistors come prepackaged with the smoke in them and when you let the smoke out you can't put it back in so <laughs> you have to buy a new one with new smoke but anyways all kidding aside how do we do that what is a safe way to power this up so we can at least test the function of the circuit without destroying our new component that we put in because maybe this one was bad but this one may also have been bad and you missed it. As soon as you turn this thing on, this one shorts into this one and kills this one again and now you're back where you started. Well, I'll kind of show you, there's a lot of a lot of precautions you can take, but I'll show you the number one most most important one as long as you know what we're talking about working on things like audio amplifiers, power supplies, things like that okay so you've all seen this two or three times in my past videos and I've drawn schematics of it and everything else but if you look over here um, I obviously have a variac that's not what I that's not my go-to equipment for that though right here this light bulb is my go-to test device that light bulb is wired in series with that little outlet right there and if you notice here is a toggle switch and a fuse the fuse is in line with the light bulb and the toggle switch goes across the light bulb okay so what we're essentially doing is we are if that switch is open we are essentially putting this light bulb in series with the amplifier so going down here what it would be like is here's your power supply okay and here's the three different versions you know for 110 or 220 or whatever okay so here's our general model okay basically what we're doing is we're interrupting you know instead of going straight into the outlet we're putting a light bulb in series with that outlet and what's going to happen here is our AC is coming in here if this transformer sees a real heavy load up here okay so this transistor is still shorted up here it shorts out or or one of the outputs is shorted okay out here it's still shorted these guys are still shorted it's going to put excessive current on this power supply which is going to carry over to the input which is going to carry over to here and what's going to happen is that excessive current is going to go into this light bulb and it's going to cause this bulb to light up bright okay and if this bulb lights up bright, it's telling you that there's excessive current or there's very low resistance in this circuit somewhere. Now, this is going to limit the current to the circuit. The current's going to go in the bulb and not in the circuit. So it's going to keep low enough current on this circuit, hopefully, from damaging things further, okay? The idea is you, you only want to put either a 60 or 100 watt bulb depending on what it is you're trying to do. And that bulb is going to absorb that excess current 
and prevent something from burning. Now it's not going to prevent something from being shorted, but it's going to prevent that short from damaging other components. And you can go ahead and, you know, remove and replace components and until finally that bulb does not light up bright. It'll come up real dim, it'll flash as the capacitors are charging in your power supply because of the current, but as those caps charge, the current's going to drop way down and that bulb will drop to a dim glow. Now you've seen me do that on uh, other videos where I've tested it. And that's exactly what I'm doing, okay? When I know that this is all good, then I can go ahead and jumper that out or put, throw my switch, which basically shunts out that bulb, and that puts full power to it. Once I know, I don't have any more shorts. But that's the way to do it. Anytime you replace a component that, that was shorted, and you're not sure that that's the only thing, definitely use what we call that dim bulb tester. That's what a dim bulb tester is. And that's going to ensure that you don't damage your valuable new components that you just replaced. Okay? So uh, hope that helps you out. If you look at uh, a couple of my previous videos, one or two or three videos ago, you'll you'll see I talk about that. I think it was in the last viewer question uh, and answer I I addressed that a little bit in that one too, and I actually drew you a little schematic of what it is. Okay, hope that helps you out on that. Okay, we'll be back. All right, the next question that I got deals with. Um, I've had a lot of people, where'd you get the schematic for this receiver? Where'd you get the schematic for that piece of test equipment you're working on? Where did you get the manual for this? Well, there's a whole bunch of really good, well-organized websites for that. Um, for, and I'll try to put, and, and I'm just talking over right now, but I may come back when I edit the video. I'm going to try to, to overlay some screen captures, do some picture in pictures of some screen captures from the web of some websites that you can use to look up um, service manuals and download them. The first one you want to that we want to talk about is called the Boat Anchor uh, Manual Archive. Boat Anchor Manual Archive, and it's short. It's abbreviated B A M A. All right, um, and it's a short website address, and I will like I said, try to do a picture-in-picture -picture screen capture of that, and uh, or, or at least subtitle the, the website there. And that's the Boat Anchor Manual Archive is definitely um, a good place to look for service manuals for like test equipment. So if you look over here at this ICO 147A, or if you look over at the ICO 950 we were working on, up here, or you want to look at the uh, the Sencor, or the SG165 we did the service call on, or the WR50B, um, any any of those pieces of old test equipment, um, you can typically find the service manuals at that website and download it. So that's a good place to start. Uh, there's many other places you can kind of do Google searches, but they're out there for receivers and stereos and amplifiers and things like that um, a good site to belong to is called Hi-Fi Engine H-I-F-I-E-N-G-I-N-E HiFiEngine.com now in order to access the downloads you will have to get a membership there and it doesn't cost anything um, but you have to sign up for it they, there's a little approval process where they review your application and approve it, at which point they'll email you a password and you'll get your own account and you can log in and then it will let you have access and download to the service manuals for a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean a ton of manuals. And it's, it's a shared thing. People upload things. It's old manuals that you can't get anymore from the manufacturers because the, either the manufacturer's out of business or the machines and you know the equipment's at end of life and you can't can't get them anymore and it's not supported by the manufacturer anymore that's your only hope so again I'll try to do a, a uh, picture in picture of that so you can take a look at it all right okay all right 
last part of this, um, I get a lot of questions on probes. Um, you know, what, uh, what kind of probes do you use for this or that, or do you have a schematic for a probe for this or that, or how do they work, or how can I make my own? Uh, lots and lots and lots of questions. So I thought I'd take some time to go over some of this with you and hopefully uh, give you a little bit of insight as to, uh, as you can see, most of these probes, with the exception of a couple here, are homemade. I made them myself. So um, why do we do that? Well, first of all, a lot of these are made of unobtainium. And you know what that means. That means you can't get them. Um, these probes, I think there is some rift in the space-time continuum out there. And uh, if we were able to travel through space and time, we would find another dimension where all the lost probes of all previous test equipment, old test equipment, have all gone and collected. Because, I don't know if you all look at this, but if you're into buying vintage test equipment, I give it about a 1% chance when you buy a piece of used test equipment that the probes will actually be with it. I don't know why that is. I really don't understand it, but it's the way it is. Probes are just never with the test equipment. So what does that leave us with? We can try to go online and, you know, go on eBay or somebody and, and buy the probe, but you'll never find them. And that leaves us with one alternative. You can try to purchase a modern probe, which oft times won't work with your old equipment. Or, last option, you got to build your own. So I'm going to show you a few different ones and a couple different schematics that uh, hopefully will help you to build some of your own probes. So this first one here, you can usually find some of this stuff online. This is a vacuum tube voltmeter or VTVM probe. Now any of you that have a VTVM, and I did a little video on meters, may, may have, this may look familiar to you. And there's different versions of this probe, but they all have essentially the same thing inside. Okay, So if you notice, and, and when we're talking vacuum tube voltmeter, we're talking here's a VTVM that uses regular probes. But up here, like this uh, RCA Senior Volt Ohmist, um, those use these types of probes. Okay, And if you notice, there's a switch on there, and that switch says AC ohms and DC. Okay? So when you're doing when you're testing DC voltage or DC signals, you would switch it to here. And if you're testing if you're testing resistance ohms or AC voltage signals, you're going to slide the switch to here. And there's really only one thing that that switch does and it basically switches in or out a single resistor. That's all that's in this, a resistor. So if we look at the little schematic. Now this is for a Heath kit, but they're pretty much all the same. Uh, you basically have right here, you have your black lead, which is your ground, and you can see, so that goes to the negative lead, um, and you can see the negative lead is usually connected directly into your VTVM, and it usually has an alligator clip or something like that on it, a crocodile clip, whatever you want to call it. And then the positive lead, or your test lead, is going to be one of these. And if you look here, some of them use, you know, use the shielded wire like this, but they'll come off of the shield over here, which is ground, and they'll put a ground lead there, which, you know, either way it doesn't matter. But inside this little tube here is a switch, as you can see, and that switch is just an SPDT or a uh, yeah single pole double throw switch. So the output of the switch goes to the meter, okay, and the tip of your probe connects to a one mega ohm resistor. That's it. It's a basic one mega ohm resistor. By flipping the switch this way, the signal is forced to go through the one meg before it gets out. And 
for DC measurements, the meter is set up so that this one mega ohm resistance has to be in series with the test the load under test or the reading will be incorrect. This is making it a very high impedance piece of test equipment. That's the purpose of it. But putting this in there, you're making a high impedance input signal. There's also more impedance in the circuit of the meter itself. So a lot of times these things will have anywhere from 10 to 20 mega ohms or even up to 100 mega ohms of input impedance. Okay, So that's what, uh, what this is for. And then for AC measurements and resistance measurements, those are very, those are different. And you flip the switch here and it just directly connects the probe to your meter. And that's really all a VTVM probe has in it. Okay. All right. The next kind of probe we're going to talk about is called a demodulator probe. They're called a demodulator probe, a detector probe, or an RF probe. They're, it's all kind of an interchangeable term. And this is a little more complicated than the VTVM probe. Now, once again, there's two different per versions of this. Well, they're really the same kind of thing, but this one can be used on like a VTVM for measuring RF voltage, okay, for instance. Um, there's another type that looks like a regular oscilloscope probe, but it has the same circuitry in it as this, but it's designed to plug into your oscilloscope. Uh, and then the other one is, here's the one I built, and this one, basically you plug this end into the oscilloscope, this end you just put a normal times one, if you look there, times one oscilloscope probe, okay, it needs to be times one for what you're doing here times 10 puts another big resistor in there and kind of messes up your readings but anyhow that's what uh, and, and it does the same job as a dedicated oscilloscope demodulator probe now, why do you need a demodulator probe well I have a little paper here I printed out so whenever you look at RF like you're looking at a signal in a radio, an AM radio, and there's lots of good videos on this out there on the web. Um, All American 5 radio is one of them. Uh, Richard there is probably, he's very, very thorough, very brilliant, and he just does such a wonderful job um, with his videos and explaining this and sharing his time and knowledge, and he is a wealth of knowledge, but All American 5 radio. Uh, all one word dot com uh, or and he also has a YouTube channel but anyhow he shows one of his videos he shows how this works but basically what you're looking at here is the the little zigzaggy lines is your RF carrier so for those of you who are in the radio that would be your channel so like if you're listening to AM 670 this would be a 670 kilohertz carrier wave or, or RF signal radio wave okay and then these big bumps is the sound or the audio that is riding on that RF carrier the problem is it modulates in both directions at the same time so if you take the sum of this volt this positive voltage plus this negative voltage it always equals zero so if you were to just take your regular oscilloscope probe and put it on there, you would never see the RF. It would never be there. Okay? So as a result, you wouldn't see the RF. Now, inside this probe are a couple of small components. Okay? So the first thing that you're going to have is a diode. Okay? And that diode can be in this configuration, or it can be across positive and negative this way. The whole idea is in one direction, it's going to either short that out to ground, or it's going to just block. In this case, it's set to block. 
the idea is you only want half or like the positive or the negative going part of the waveform to come out so they don't cancel each other out and give you a flat line so what you end up seeing is only half of the modulated signal any any of the RF that's going negative is clipped off by the diode and the positive going gets through and when you look at it through a scope you actually will get to see the modulation so what it does is it's basically a, a detector just like a detector this, this is what's in a radio to strip the RF off and give you sound in an AM radio It's basically a detector diode and that's what this is doing conversely when you look at these signal tracers whether it's an ICO 147 or a Heath kit or any of the other ones at the front end where you plug in your probe that's essentially and here's here's my version that I built that's essentially what it is there's a diode in there and it's stripping off the RF and allowing just the modulated part to come out okay so that's what's inside of there now this is a homemade one that I made for my ICO 147 and the ICO actually has the diode and everything built in already I think if I recall correctly I don't remember it's been a while but basically all I did was I went to a hardware store big box hardware store and I bought a piece of aluminum tubing you can buy it in you know in the hardware section where they sell screws and bolts and things like that they have aluminum tubing that you can buy. I have a piece that's not round. So for example, here's a here's a square piece that I have. And you can see there's the end of it. This one's square, but they also make round, like this piece. And that's really all that this that that, that, that is that I'm making it out of. And I got some plastic and I turned it down on my wood lathe. I carved it down and made two little ends on it. And I put a piece of brass rod that I shaved down, put it to make a tip. And then inside here, the brass rod comes in here and I soldered uh, these little components it's my little diode and capacitor. Okay. And then it goes out to a jack. And that jack connects into just a piece of coax like this. And then this way I can use one piece of uh, BNC to BNC coax. And I can use all of my different probes with one lead. And I don't have a bunch of leads tangled up. And this is the ground lead. And it just connects to the shield here. And you can kind of see where I took this and ran it up here and soldered it on there. Okay. And basically that's all, this is just a commercial, fancier than mine version of it that's made, you know, made for, actually this came with uh, one of my pieces of test equipment. It was a uh, TV analyzer, a B and K, B and K 315 or something, it's back there. I don't use it very much. But anyhow, that's all it is. So that's an RF demodulator probe. And again, they make a, another version where they take that same little diode circuit and they put it into an oscilloscope probe, but they put some extra capacitors and things to make sure that the, the frequency response of the probe and everything is accurate. But it's pretty much essentially the same thing. You can order them online. They're not cheap. Um, or you can do like I did. And all I did was basically took that little diode and capacitor circuit and mounted it to a terminal strip inside of here I'm sorry I didn't have the screws out and just put two jacks there's really nothing else in here and this works really great if I'm looking at an AM radio and I want to look at the you know the uh, demodulated audio to, to check it this works perfect I plug this into my scope I put take the tip of this in times one and I can go around and check all the different IF sections and so forth and it's very high impedance so it doesn't really load the circuit down in some spaces it will but that's another lesson and that's what this is so those are demodulator probes that's pretty much what they are now 
these four here, and they're all basically, like I said, uh, the, these are just the same. Each one's the same. This one, these two are the same, and these two are the same. The only difference is this one, these ones, I just took the components and kind of cobbled them together and covered them in heat shrink. And these ones I mounted into a nice little box, but it's the same circuit, okay? And these are the two probes that come with that SG-165 signal generator. So, if you have one of those signal generators, and like I said, 90% of the time, chances are you're not going to get the probe with it, um, this is what it is, okay? I'll give you a little idea. So, let me dig out the schematic for these, because they're a little more complex. Okay. So the first one here is your detector probe, and this is the most important one up for the SG-165, okay? And if you notice, it has an output that goes to your SG-165, and it has an input of three wires, okay? And if you look at the schematic here, what they're doing is you're going out to your SG-165, and that's a Gazauta, not a Gazinta. These are Gazintas here. Okay, it goes into there, so I call it the Gazinta. <laughs> so, you have a red wire, a blue wire, and a black wire. And you can see here, I just kind of marked them, the blue, the red, and the black. And if you notice, part of it is just a fancy demodulator probe, okay? And a ground, and then this one directly bypasses the demodul so this there's a undemodulated signal and a demodulated signal okay and there's a very specific way you have to connect this when this is used this is used especially when you're working on a uh, FM circuit okay when you're looking at FM radio because basically you have one part is actually your signal the other parts going into your uh, ratio detector or your um, uh, your uh, what's the other detector type right now again I'm having a senior moment anyhow this part goes to your detection circuit of the FM this part goes to the RF this part goes to ground and the book actually tells you this instructions tells you how to connect this in and what this is going to do is this is going to take that um, FM modulated signal put it into the scope, the scope is, or put it into the um, SG-165, and then the SG-165 also has a marker signal, and the marker signal gets combined through a resistor into this same area and then goes out to your oscilloscope. So that's called a post marker, or it adds the marker signal post signal, or after you detect it. So basically by putting the marker, that's your point of reference to measure your signal, and then this is the actual signal that's going to give you that S curve, okay? Uh, I may be talking over some people here that, aren't, that don't know FM radio yet, but anyhow, this is the thing that makes that S curve that you can put your marker onto uh, so that you can look on your oscilloscope and see it. Now, again, uh, if I... I'm doing an FM receiver sometime, I'll go through all that. I don't have any equipment right now set up to do that, but the next one I do, I'll try to do shoot some video of it, but that's what that is. Okay. The next probe, and that's this one, and if you take it apart, here's all I did. I just took a little piece of tag board. Tag board means it just has these little solder tag things, little post board, whatever you want to call it. And you can see your four, re your four resistors, okay, there they are, your signal diode, which, by the way, these diodes on all of these must be germanium diodes. The silicon diode, the breakdown voltage is way too high, and they're not going to work properly for detecting uh, RF. So, again, germanium, like a 1N34A, or a 1N270, something like that. This one's a 1N774, okay? So any of those that are basically germanium signal diode, look that up, 
If you're looking to, to order one online, look for germanium signal diode. So anyhow, and you can see how I did it. I just came off of the of just a plain old BNC jack. Came in. There's your two capacitors. There's your four resistors. There's your little signal diode, and then coming out with your output wires. Very simple. Nothing to it. Piece of cake. The next one is not quite as important. Um, really, the main reason this one is important is if you're trying to get the you're trying to measure gain like in decibels in DB DBM or DBV or whatever and and you want all of that to be accurate you have to match the impedance of your test equipment to the impedance of the device under test so there's you know some antennas are 75 ohm impedance some antenna circuits that are you know that are uh, balanced are 300 ohm okay so any of you ham radio folks out there should understand a little bit about that balanced and unbalanced 300 ohm and 75 ohm so basically all this box does is it takes the signal coming out of your test equipment out of that SG165 the output and matches it to the correct impedance now I don't have a really big schematic so I'll try to zoom you in here on uh, on the matching pad here and there's the matching pad right there and you can see all it is is a resistor and capacitors in parallel and you can see they have a 20 microfarad um, non-polar capacitor and a 0 0.001 microfarad in series or I mean in parallel and they're in parallel with a one mega ohm resistor okay and then those go into series with a 120 ohm standard resistor okay and basically all this is doing is by going through here you're adding a little bit of decoupling first of all between the circuit under test so you don't put a load on that circuit and you don't put bad voltages back here so it decouples some of your DC and puts higher impedance here and then by changing how you go to ground either directly to ground you can see this here's your ground this lead goes directly to ground this lead goes through another 120 ohm resistor to ground and basically that's what's giving you from going from here to here, you're going to have a 300 ohm impedance. From here to here, you're going to have a 75 ohm impedance. That's all. That's basically what that's used for. So it's an impedance matching device and a signal, kind of a signal decoupler, if you want to call it that. All right. And again, Tony's really cobbly, cheap. <laughs> Look, I didn't spend a lot of time doing this, guys. I needed I just needed to be able to use it. And here it is, and it works. You can see this is a non-polarized capacitor and I I you can't get 20 microfarad anymore. They're hard to find, so I used a 22. And there's there's your 0 .001, couple of resistors, okay? Some odd values, but basically again, you got four resistors, two capacitors, and that's the whole thing. And there's your wires going out. And again, even though it doesn't look great, it works perfectly. I don't have any problems making them like that. And then I decided, since I had some of this aluminum, three-quarter inch aluminum tubing, or five-eighths inch, whatever it is, tubing left off, and I just put heat shrink over it to isolate the aluminum, um, I'm gonna, I made a couple of skinnier ones, and I did a little neater job. I soldered them on some... Uh, perf board which is kind of like some you know experimenters circuit board so if you look it's this stuff that's all it is a piece of that in here I just cut it down to size and just kind of soldered this together and then put some protective heat shrink coating over it soldered the proper colors of wires and these are uh, Teflon coated wires uh, with silver plated thin string and so this is really good high quality wire to last a long time uh, it's won't burn won't melt 
uh, good wire. Okay, and uh, this is basically going to be the detector probe, and I'm just going to put it into some of this stuff, and just you know, similar to this with the wires coming out this end and another jack on this end, and then. This is the matching pad, and I didn't even use circuit board for that. I just kind of jumpered the components together, twisted the leads, soldered them together, boom. And that's all there is to it. So this will make it a little more compact than having these great big boxes hanging out there. Even though this hasn't really given me any trouble, it works pretty well. So that's what that is. Now let's talk a little bit about some other probes that are... Simple, very simple, easy to make, but you really need them if you're going to work on radio. Okay, let me back you out. This first one is called a, a coupling loop, is what I call it. All right. So this is a coupling loop. And really all this is, is just several turns of solid stranded wire, or solid wire. Okay, I like solid because it holds its shape. And you're going to find out that it, doesn't really matter what the length of this wire is. Um, just a few turns. I have one that has more turns, and this one only has this has four turns. I have another one that maybe has eight turns. It's not not much different. Again, the, this isn't supposed to be resonant. This is just supposed to be some metal surface area in a coil that can radiate RF. And then you can connect that to your test leads for your signal generator. See it? And what that's going to do is it's going to increase. So if you want to couple your signal generator to the antenna of a radio, but you don't want the signal generator to touch the antenna of the radio, this is how you do it. So you connect your leads from your signal generator across this little coil of wire that you made. You hold it near your radio and it will pick up the radio will receive the signal now let's see if I can demonstrate hold on okay as you hear I have a radio here and it doesn't have any uh, any signal it's tuned to all right but if I take my signal generator with my loop as I bring it close you can see and the closer I get to the antenna, the clearer it gets. The further away I get. See? So this basically radiates. And you can see it's directional. Okay? And that's what this does. Okay? So this is how you loosely couple your RF signal from your signal generator to a tuner or to a radio when you're working on it. So let's say I was going to align this radio. I would take this coil and I would couple it, just put it near the antenna, and that would couple the signal. And then I would be able to peak my IF and my RF and all that. Okay. The other thing is, when I turn this on, you're going to find out that if I tune off of it, it goes away. If I tune back to it, and you can see. So I can also use this to align the RF part. Now, here's something else that's cool. Notice how I'm able to tune it in and out. Now watch what's going to happen here in a minute. Okay, notice, again, it's on, but watch what happens now. No matter where I tune, how come? Why is it doing that? Now, most of you know why, but for those of you who don't, let's take a look. What frequency are we at up here? You see it? 455 kilohertz. Okay, or 0.455 megahertz. That is the intermediate frequency, or the 
IF frequency of an AM radio. And what it's doing is it's going right through that tuner and going straight into the IF section of that radio and modulating the radio at the IF stage. What that means is it doesn't really care where your RF is tuned to. It's always going to sync up to that 455 kilohertz RF or IF frequency. Okay. Why did I show that to you? Well, the reason I showed you that is how do we know quickly if, a, if, the, if the radio is working, like if the RF section of the radio is working or not? Well, if you put it in RF and you try to tune it and you can't tune your, your uh, signal in. So like you set your signal to 1 megahertz and I go over here to 1 megahertz and I go all over it and I don't get a signal then I can always go to my 455 kilohertz. If my signal shows up, then that tells me that my oscillator is probably not working or something in the front end of the radio is not working. But at least my IF section of the radio is working. So it's a quick troubleshooting tool you can do without even taking the covers off your radio. All right. So that's a little tech tip for that probe. So don't un underestimate the simplicity <laughs> of this uh, little piece of wire. It's an important test tool. I use it all the time. Okay. Now, let's take a look at something else. And that would be this. What is this? Well, I basically went and I just took an empty BNC jack like this and I attached a piece of just regular coax wire you know like good old-fashioned coax you know kinda like uh, let's see right here coax like that just tacked it right onto there and came out stiffened it up with some heat shrink and at the very end of the coax I attached a teeny version of this so basically this is just right inside here this round thing that's magnet wire. I just took magnet wire, wrapped it around my finger. I used a 31 inch piece. 31 inches is roughly the length of a FM antenna. So it'll kind of work there. But it's not that important, not that critical. Just some turns of wire. And then I kind of pinched it till it's kind of oval shaped. And then covered it over with heat shrink. So, there, so it's electrically isolated. I can then take my coax I plug into it like that and over here I can connect it into my oscilloscope right there now what the heck is that gonna do well we call this an RF sniffing circuit or an RF sniffer okay and the reason I call it that is you can take this little wand here that we have and let's see if we can get this whole thing in the shot here let's move this up here and you see my little loop antenna you see it and watch what happens when I get close to that what's happening look at that see that now let's see when we get it closer to an RF or a uh, FM signal because this remember this is a little higher frequency. You can make you can make a bigger one with less turns of wire and a little bit bigger diameter, less turns, okay, or more turns or whatever you want. And let's see here frequency. Uh, And watch this now. And you can see and there's your RF. Right? And you can see it's being modulated right now. Okay? So I can do and you can see that's an RF sniffer probe. And again, the, the uh, 
you can change this to be you know more or less turns longer or shorter wire bigger and smaller diameter and it affects how this circuit works okay but basically all it is is a non-invasive in other words non-contact way that you can move this around okay see what I'm doing and you can see you can measure RF okay I can change the frequency and it's got a pretty wide range here so let's do one megahertz and you can see once again I gotta change my scope because I'm at a different frequency and take a look so so this one works really good with AM radio okay other lengths and sizes will work with different frequencies different ways but you can see it's very directional so if I if I take this and I turn it you can see how it like moving it around so you can really sniff sniff out signals in your radio so you would take this probe and if you're looking for like you know you're looking at an RF can for instance one of those little RF transformers and you want to see which one is not oscillating you can move this around them and you can see which ones have signal on them and which ones don't so this is called an RF sniffer probe again very simple we build it in 10 minutes okay sometimes I mean some people you can even just take a piece of uh, like number 14 house wire solid copper like you'd use in your house electrical wire and just take and solder one one pin to the center post of your jack and one to the outer shield center and shield want it run it up here wind a couple of turns bring it back down solder the other end that simple nothing to it okay very very simple so that's another type of probe that you can use alright so those are just a few of the pieces of test equipment that I use to work on radio and really the stuff that you can make very inexpensively for yourself and it's gonna help move you way ahead I mean again these are things that don't cost a lot of money but they expand the use of your test equipment so between these probes a simple signal generator a simple cheap oscilloscope and I showed you the the low end you know the low cost one that I had um, that I take on the road and a meter and you can do a whole lot of different troubleshooting with it so anyhow I hope uh, this video helps you all out a little bit and answers some of your questions and uh, more to come later like I said um, be, be looking out for my ICO ST70 video it's going to be coming out pretty soon but uh, again the first I did the first shoot the first part of the video where I'm disassembling and cleaning it jumps around an awful lot usually I prepare everything ahead and then I order all the parts and I have everything on hand before I start a project this one's kind of expensive I'm a little bit short on funding business has been really busy this uh, this quarter you really don't have any spare cash so <laughs> I'm kind of holding off on uh, purchasing any more parts or anything for right now so the video is a little bit convoluted a little jumping jumps around a little bit but I'll get it posted up here in the next couple of days but in the meantime, I thought I'd answer some of your questions. I hope I did. I hope this helps you out. Um, if it does, please give me a uh, thumbs up here. And uh, more to come later for sure. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great weekend.